Welcome to the Shared Practices Podcast. We have back with us today Brandon Moncrief from McLaren and Associates, the principal and CEO of uh, McLaren. And we had a really amazing conversation last time about the state of the DSO market and why dentists are considering and are selling and why things are going that way, some of the pros and cons, but but we need to get into the weeds on the details of how these deals work. Because if you don't understand how they work, yeah, like you're, you could be comparing things that are not the same. So Brandon, welcome back to the show. Thanks. Good to see you again. Yeah. So uh, let, let's get into this. We we had kind of teased this a little bit at the end of the ep- last episode. So if, if anyone hasn't listened to that one, go back and listen to that. We're going to talk about these deal structures. And I don't think I was even aware of all the different deal structures of these DSO opportunities for a, a single site owner. So take us through that, the broad overview. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there's too much emphasis on upfront valuation, mm. right? Everybody wants to talk about EBITDA, EBITDA multiples. What was your valuation? And I would argue that fit is the DSO a good fit for your particular practice is a good fit for your goals and your why. And then deal structure are equally important, mm. if not more important than the initial valuation. You know, for many doctors, the second bite of the apple, that equity component at recap is going to be worth as much or more than the initial cash at close that they take on the valuation. So understanding the nuances involved with deal structure, I think is critical to making a decision as to what path you're going to go down. And if you met one DSO, you met one DSO. They're all different. Yeah. Not only are they different from a deal structure perspective, but you know they all have a different financial sponsor. They're all at a different place in their recap cycle. They've all got a different management team, a different viewpoint perspective on how involved they are from an operational perspective, from a clinical perspective. So I think, you know, first point, it's key to create optionality. Mm. If you're going to go down the DSO private equity road, you need to shop around, you need to date around, you get to know the players and, you know, understand what are the different types of DSOs that are out there? What are the different types of deal structures that are out there so that you have a broad perspective of the marketplace before you know, you pick your pony and decide on, you know, who you're going to tether yourself to. I, and, and I think it's funny because there's like, there's like five or six words you've already said that I'm like, oh crap, I hope our listeners like know what that means. And I, I hope they know what this means. Would it be okay if we started with like, you know, someone is selling a hundred percent of their practice and a, a regular traditional sale a hundred percent of that, they would be getting cash on close. They would, they would be cashing out everything, all of their equity. Um, versus in a DSO sale, there's kind of more to that. And, and it's, when you say DSO deal structures, there's, this is part of it of like the different pieces of how you get paid, but then there's also like how the partnership works and all of that. So I want to get into all of that, but I want to start with this, like the money you get at close versus the money get, that gets held back in different forms. Absolutely. So, you know, from a private buyer perspective, a more traditional practice sale perspective, it's pretty cut and dry, right? You're not going to have to commit to stay on long-term post-close. You're typically going to see 100% cash at close. And it's just very simplistic, right? It's very predictable. You walk away. You get, yeah. you get to re- actually retire from this practice and you get money in the bank. Absolutely. So that's clear cut. From a DSO perspective, there's a lot more strings attached. There's a lot more levers. There's a lot more structure to these transactions. So at a broad level, every DSO transaction, if you're looking to maximize value, right? Now, occasionally a DSO will buy 100% of a practice and allow a doctor to walk away. That's typically a DSO that's buying a practice in a geography where they have substantial density, Mm. but they're going to pay more like a traditional private practice sale price. Right. You're not going to see a premium compared to selling to a private practice owner. So, you know, it's not really that compelling. Mm. If you want to maximize your valuation and go down the DSO path, these deals are all going to have some structural components to them. There's going to be a cash at close component. It's going to be somewhere in the range of, let's say, 50 to 80% cash at close. It's always going to be a majority interest in the business that you're selling. 
And I would say these days, because of interest rates and capital markets the way they are, the macro environment, you know, the cash at close to some degree has declined a little bit mm. over the past six to 12 months. I think that's a temporary issue. So we used to see a lot of DSOs offering 75, 80% cash at close. Today, that's more like 50 to 70% cash at close. And then the other component of the deal structure is going to be an equity component. Mm. Now, how that equity functions, where that equity lies, that's what distinguishes DSO deal structure from DSO deal structure. So we can kind of talk through, you know, there's really four primary deal structures that we see out there. So let's talk about kind of like the traditional DSO deal, the deal that's been happening for not just the past five to seven years, but the framework under which DSOs have been buying practices for the past 10 to 20 years. And that's more so, I'm going to buy 100% of your business. We're going to set the valuation at close. I'm going to give you 70% cash up front. And then there's going to be what they'll refer to as a holdback or an earnout mm. for, let's call it three to five years. So just for hypothetical circumstances, let's just say the purchase price is a million bucks. Obviously, on most DSO transactions, we're talking about larger practices, multi-million, but just for mathematical purposes, yep. we'll say the purchase price is a million bucks. That DSO is going to pay $700,000 cash at close. They're going to put $300,000 on a, let's call it a three-year holdback. And that holdback, you earning it, is contingent upon the practice mirroring from a revenue and EBITDA perspective what it was doing at the time of sale and you fulfilling your post-closing employment agreement. So they're going to pay that $300,000 to you over three years in three annual installments okay. of $100,000 predicated upon you maintaining revenue and EBITDA and fulfilling your employment agreement. That structure for most of our clients is not real sexy mm. because there's no upside on the valuation. It's just a chain. Yeah. there It's, it's just you're selling 100% of your business. You're giving up all the EBITDA and there's a ceiling on your proceeds that's capped at the initial valuation, as opposed to all the other deal structures we're going to talk about. You've got a rolled equity component or a retained equity component that's going to likely grow in value because that equity is liquidated in the future at a recapitalization event. And you get to enjoy the financial arbitrage, the financial upside that private equity is generating as opposed to being limited by the initial valuation. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and, it it seems like it would lend itself to a checked out owner. Like I'm I'm here because I have to be, but there's no upside. But I can't just disappear and leave. My question is on on these holdbacks. Um, you know, you say in this example we we're saying a hundred thousand dollars a year predicated on you staying and maintaining a level of revenue or profitability. Like, how do they structure the the what ifs? So, like, you know, if, if you stop working, then you no longer get any of it. But what if revenue declines or profitability declines? Is it a percentage of that 100000 How does that work? Before we keep going, I'd like to talk about practice by numbers. You may have heard previous ads where I've talked about the development rate, why I switched from Dental Intel to PBN, subscription fatigue. I talked about all the efficiencies that can be had by having an all-in-one platform, a singular solution for all of your problems. I think the piece that I haven't really talked about, which is honestly the piece I'm most passionate about, is the analytics side of things. PBN has always been a company where people who are passionate about analytics love to go to PBN because they have the most up-to-date, thorough analytics, and honestly, I think the most accurate. For me, it's extremely great being back home at PBN. I feel like I have a much better pulse on what things are happening in all of our offices. The thing that I'm excited about in this next stage of our integration of PBN and through our organization is getting those efficiencies in place so that we can have our staff focusing more on helping patients and less time scanning documents, sending statements, calling patients for bookings, having all of our bookings online, having increased bookings through, having a more efficient method to do that. There's the immediate benefits, there's the saving money, there's the having better, more accurate data, but then there's the benefits that compound over time as you get it more thoroughly integrated into your practice. It's important for me to talk about those benefits because those are the things that make your life easier, lower your stress, increase the feelings of control that you have in your practice where you know what's going on. 
And that's where the difference is between a PBN power user and just kind of an average PBN user. A lot of the SP listeners on this podcast are passionate about improvement in their practice, improvement in their workflows and analytics. And so if you have any of those things describe you, I mean, practice by numbers is where you need to be. So practicebynumbers.com, take a look at their website, look at the all-in-one offerings, look at everything they offer. And I'd be surprised if you don't switch. I think that's a great question. And that's when you start to talk about the levers, the nuances of these deals that are so important and they're negotiable. So, you know, do you have to work chair side at all? Mm. Or can you backfill your production with an associate? It depends, right? That's, that's typically negotiable to some degree. What happens if revenue declines? Is there a hard cliff? Do you have to mirror a hundred percent of what the revenue or EBITDA was pre-sale in order to get your earn out? Or do you not start to erode that earn out until maybe you hit the 90% mark, right? So if you get close, you still get your money or you get a prorated portion of your money. That's negotiable. Typically, we won't, don't want it to be a hard cliff. You've got to hit 100% Otherwise, of revenue you get or, or you get nothing. That right? would suck, yeah. yeah. We, want the, it, we want it to be prorated the, to some degree. The market shifts, there's bumps, There's things happen. And even if you're there with your heart and soul, like you might not hit the same number you hit last year. Right. The other thing is, is there a makeup provision? In other words, if you miss the whole back in one year, can you, if you get back to status quo in year mm. two, can you get paid out for both year one and year two? Interesting. So those are the levers that we're trying to pull. Those are the things that we're negotiating. You've got to obviously carve out for death and disability, right? Because that could be a huge interruption, especially if it's a one doctor practice. So whether we're tar- talking about earnouts, holdbacks, or the equity component, we need to identify, you know, what are the levers by which you get diluted or lose the holdback? Mm. And how do we mitigate those levers as much as possible to allow for flexibility where you have the opportunity to recover right. if you just have a temporary interruption like COVID, right. right? Or a temporary disability, you break your wrist or whatever it may be. So if you don't have a sell side advisor, if you don't have somebody there to control that narrative and actually know what questions to ask, and what to manipulate in those negotiations with the SOs, well, good luck. It's going to be a hard conversation. Well, and uh, uh, Andrew Klingen asked us before we did this interview, he was asking, you know, is that changing those holdback requirements uh, in the current environment? And your, your answer was really interesting to me about the clinical requirements in particular for doctors, that being looser than it used to be. Yeah, so used to... Traditionally, DSOs would require sellers, founders to stay on for, let's say, two to three years post-closing. But it came with some pretty strict conditions. You had to produce a certain amount, work a certain number of days days clinically, whether it was weekly, monthly, annually. You were really tethered to the chair. And this new iteration of DSOs with new deal structures that we'll talk about in a minute they have prolonged the post-closing commitment. So it Mm. used to be two to three years. Now they want a three to five year post-closing commitment in order to maximize value, but they offer a lot more autonomy. There's a lot more flexibility. It doesn't mean you staying on three to five years chair side. You could literally with most DSOs step away chair side immediately. So long as you backfill your production with associate doctors, private equity DSOs, they don't really care who's producing the dentistry. This is a financial play for them. They just want to maintain the EBITDA. So it doesn't really impact EBITDA in regards to who's doing the work. Mm. So while the post-closing time frame commitment has increased, mm. it's not uh, near as strict as far as what it means to stay on post-close as it was, you know, previous to the past, let's say three to five years. Interesting. So a well, lot more flexibility. And, and with that, it actually, in my mind, it makes a lot of sense to have already replaced yourself clinically before you've done this because then ironically, even the ones who want the owner to stay on, like you've already, you've already removed yourself from the clinical bit. Like it's no longer dependent on you clinically. So that is one way to like ensure that you're kind of selling honestly and you're not going to get like dinged if the person that you replace yourself with uh, can't produce what you produce. They're not as good at case acceptance or diagnosis or, or any of that. Like, uh, Maybe maybe by being the super producer and selling at the absolute peak, your initial payout is bigger and you just know you're going to take a hit on the clawback if if the profitability and, and revenue of the office 
uh, drops down. Yeah, I, mean, I think bifurcating production among multiple providers and driving down that key man risk pre-sale I, in an ideal world would be the way to go. Right. And we still sell a lot of practices, single doctor, you know, super producer, or you know, multi-doctor practice, but the owner, the founder is still the primary producer. And we still are able to negotiate that flexibility, but there's, there's less predictability because you've got to go identify that associate that's going to backfill your production. And if you have some type of earn out, clawback, dilution provision, you know, that money is at risk should that new doctor stepping into your shoes not be able to produce at the clip that you're producing at. Um, to go back to okay. kind of talking about that traditional DSO deal structure, that 100% buyout, 70% cash at close, 30% earnout, it is extremely rare that we Doesn't have a really client go anymore. down that road. If, if a client goes down that road, it's typically an older doctor within an, a few years of retirement that doesn't really care about the upside on some sort of equity component. They know that the cash at close combined with a relatively easy earnout is enough to fund their nest egg, and their plan is to sail off into the sunset. So almost exclusively, the doctors that chase that traditional DSO deal structure are older doctors that are approaching retirement, and this is exit planning strategy. You know, it's very, very rare that one of our clients actually accepts a traditional DSO deal structure in today's environment just because it's not that attractive. There's really no upside. It's just not a very sexy model. Yeah. So moving on, we'll talk about the two DSO deal structures that we see most prevalently and what most of our clients are looking for. So first would be the holding company structure. Okay. So in this scenario, you're going to sell 100% of your business. You're going to cash out somewhere in the range of 60 to 80% of the value of the business at close. And the remainder of the value of the business is going to be rolled into, invested in stock in the DSO's parent company. Mm. So you actually own stock in the DSO, not your individual practice. There's two primary benefits of the holding company structure, well, potentially three. So if you partner with a smaller DSO that has a lot of runway for growth and you take a holding company position, potentially your upside on equity is higher than it would be in a joint venture model that we'll unpack here in a minute. So if you're partnering with a smaller DSO that's got more runway to growth, maybe they only have 20, 30 locations and the goal is to get to 500 locations over the next 10 years, you've got the potential to hit multiple recap events and that holding company equity has a higher upside really than any other equity opportunity that you're going to see. Right. Another two benefits are typically in a holding company structure, you have the option to exit your liquid, to liquidate your equity in full when you hit a recapitalization event. So let's unpack just real quick what a recapitalization event. Yeah, I was going to say, we've said recap multiple times. Let's talk about that. So a recap event is essentially a liquidity event. That's where the current investor, the private equity, the institutional, you know, financial sponsor of that DSO sells the DSO to the next investor, typically a larger private equity firm or larger institutional investor. And at the point where you reach a liquidity event, a recapitalization event, the private equity firm that obviously holds equity in that business, as well as the management team of the DSO that typically holds equity in the business, and the doctor partners that are holding holding company equity have the opportunity to exit that equity, either in full or in part, depending on the type of equity and the deal structure. One of the benefits of the holding company model compared to some of the other models is that you typically have the opportunity to exit that holding company equity in full. Mm. You can liquidate all the equity you're holding at hopefully an exponentially higher value than you paid for it. Typically in today's environment, on a three to five year recap cycle in a holding company model, the goal is to generate a three to four X return on equity, right? So if you buy let's say $500,000 in holding company stock early in the recap cycle and you get the full arbitrage, the full upside that's generated before that DSO is sold to the next investor, then that $500,000 could become, you know, 1.5 to $2 million. Right. And then if you roll that into the next recap cycle, you wait another three to five years. If the DSO is successful in hitting another recapitalization event, 
you are in compounding right. returns on that equity. But, you know, it's risk reward, right? These are not risk free investments. And there is no guarantee that you're going to be able to exit that equity in full at recap. I think that's important to point out. But in a holding company model, typically speaking, comparative to other models, the likelihood that you're going to have the opportunity to exit the equity in full is higher mm. than in some of the other models. The other benefit is diversification. When you hold equity at the DSO level, you're diversified across all the practices that DSO owns rather than just your individual office. Now that diversification can be good or bad, right? You know, is your practice the best practice in that DSO or is it an average practice? You can't control the other assets that that DSO acquires. Mm. If they make good decisions and they buy good assets, you're probably going to have a good outcome at recap. But if they buy bad assets or they overpay for them and they overlever the business, there's a chance that you have a not so favorable outcome at a recapitalization event. The other thing to point out in the holding company model, where you enter the recap cycle impacts your return on equity. Right. So if you enter the recap cycle early, so most recap cycles are three to five years. And I would say in today's environment, more like five years than three years because growth has been slowed down by the higher interest rates and the constrained capital markets. So I think you need to be prepared for, rather than some of these DSOs recapping every three to four years, it might look more like five to six years moving forward. If you enter early in the cycle, in other words, you sell to that DSO, you know, in year one of a five-year recap cycle, you're gonna generate, you're gonna pay a lower price for that stock and generate a higher return than somebody that enters in year four of a five-year recap cycle, right. right? Time value of money. If I've been holding that stock for three years, Richard, before you sell your practice and buy stock in the company, I would expect that you're going to pay more for the stock and see a muted return comparative to me, who's been partnered with that DSO for three years before you enter the picture. Right. So I, I think the thing that's confusing for Dennis when they're thinking about this is there is... The dentist who is selling their practice to the DSO is one transaction. And then the DSO sells itself every three to five years. Right. And so it's like there's a big blip and then there's all these little teeny blips and then there's another big blip. Right. It's like, so you're saying if say that this DSO has just recently sold to a new capital partner, you know, it's a new, a new investment uh, private equity group. They've got new money. So now they can go out and buy more practices. You're one of the early practices that they buy in this iteration, in this, in this l loop, you know, the bigger loop, you know, there's this three to five year loop, but you're at the beginning of that loop. You're buying when the total valuation of that company is smaller. So you're buying chips, your practice buy a bigger piece than what someone who is buying towards the end of the cycle, they've, they've absorbed 10 more practices after you, and now it's a bigger company. And so the same dental size dental practice buys a smaller piece of the company overall. And therefore their value or their gain isn't going to be as big as yours between that fourth year and the fifth year when they sell, but they're going to have a faster access to that. Right. So you're going to, it's all about, you know, what do you value? Do you value return or do you value access to liquidity? Right. right. So for some sellers, they're like, I value return. I'd rather see, um, I have to do something with that money. Yeah. I'd rather have it in the DSO and let it marinate and, and grow and generate arbitrage. For some other sellers, they want access to liquidity as fast as possible. Right. So for them, entering late in a recap cycle is attractive because they might only have to wait a year to cash out the remaining value the of their of practice. Yeah. Even though the return might be muted, right. comparative to their peer that sold years earlier, you know, they want that access to liquidity as fast as they can get it. And I think it's a good time to actually talk about how private equity, how DSOs make money. Because for a lot of dentists, they don't understand the recaps and you know, how does it make sense for, you know, you to sell a DSO with 100 locations for 15 times EBITDA and then sell it again, you know, five years later for 15 times EBITDA. It doesn't seem like you're making any money. Right. Right. So here's how it works. So 
A private equity firm comes in, buys a DSO for 15 times EBITDA. At that point, all the practices that currently exist in that DSO, the cost average paid for those practices is 15 times EBITDA, right? Because that's what they paid for the entirety of the DSO. Over that recap cycle, their goal is to go out and buy as many practices as they can for five, six, seven times EBITDA and cost average mm. down the cost of the EBITDA they've acquired Okay, and create that arbitrage, create that gap between the cost average of what they now owe on Got practices it. versus what they're going to sell for at the next recapitalization event. So if they buy 100 practices at 15 times EBITDA and they go out and buy another 300 practices at seven times EBITDA, well, that's going to bring their cost average down to like maybe nine times EBITDA. Mm. So there's still arbitrage to be gained there. And it sounds like, well, if their cost average at nine times EBITDA and they sell for 15 times EBITDA, I mean, they didn't even double their money. Right. That's where leverage comes into play. That's where utilizing debt to fuel growth juices the return substantially. So where it looks like you only gained nine times EBITDA to 15 times EBITDA, the use of leverage amplifies that return. And that's where you generate the two to four X return rather than just a simple, like, you know, 50% return comparatively speaking to what I just explained. So, uh, I'll <laughs> admit to the audience that I finally feel like I understand this <laughs> after podcasting about all this kind of stuff and, and running a group. So here's, here's what I instantly think will make this a little bit more approachable for the audience is it's like the, the reason that real estate is an attractive investment option for people is that you can get leverage on it. So I can take $50,000 and I can buy a, a $500,000 home and I've only put in 50K of my money. I've leveraged the remaining $450,000. If the market goes up another $200,000 and now I sell it for $750,000, I only put 50K in, I'm getting 250K back. I got 5X my return because of that leverage. It's a perfect analogy. So, Absolutely perfect analogy. So you're getting a combination of you are on the ground floor of this next round of buying more practices and they're not buying each individual new practice at the 15X that they just recapped for. They're buying them at this lower amount and they're using debt to do it. And because of those two things, that's where this three, four X return on your, your capital comes over that time period. I think that's very well explained. That's Whew. exactly the way it works. Okay. But uh, I think, I think that was, you know, important to unpack. Yes. A lot, of, a lot of dentists, you know, this is ethereal. They're like, you know, the buyer is telling me that they're going to generate these returns. I don't really understand how the math works. What's the methodology? I, I haven't understood it, it. I literally, until this moment, I have not clearly understood the whole process of the recaps until right now. So thank you for, for my, you know, I shouldn't say that. I should just pretend like I've known the whole time. Um, <laughs> no, this is great. I, I, I love it. So, you know, we've talked about the, the holding company structure. You know, that's kind of one of the prevalent structures that you see out there. So we talked about the, the benefits of it, right? The fact that it allows for diversification. It allows for, you know, potentially you to exit your equity in full at a recapitalization event. But there's some drawbacks as well compared to some other deal structures. And those drawbacks are, I already talked about, diversification is good if they buy good assets. It's right. bad if they buy bad assets. Uh, but the other thing is that you're selling 100% of the business. So you're giving up all the EBITDA. And by giving up all the EBITDA, your personal income is going to take a major hit, <laughs> especially if you've stepped away from the chair. Right. Right. Now, if you're still a big producer, you're still going to generate a handsome chair side income, but yep. you're paid like an associate. But you're giving up all the benefit of ownership in exchange for betting on the return at recap. So the risk reward there is a lot higher then I would say the risk reward of looking at a joint venture structure. So I, I will say I've talked to people who that first check that you get post DSO sale for your clinical income is like such like a, a like, okay. Now I get it. Now I get it. Yeah. This kind of sucks. But you've just gotten a huge payout. I, I think the other thing going back to the first model before we or not traditional, but but holding company one of the problems that you have if you get a big liquidation 
you're now responsible for a large lump sum of money and investing it well and thinking about it. And like, you're also not just like a dentist is not armed to be a good practice owner coming out of dental school, a practice owner who has liquidated $5 million and gets, you know, that much at close. And they've got another 2 million still wrapped into the holding co no one's really armed you with the tools to invest $5 million. Well, to both fuel continued growth over of your income through the rest of your working life and also your retirement. Like you're kind of unprepared for this experience of that much money at once and having the ability to invest in such an amazing opportunity of dentistry at an organized scale with leverage and with, you know, this, this triage or uh, not triage, but arbitrage, um, it's such hopefully a, not triage. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it's arbitrage. Arbitrage uh, is is an incredible place to have your money, and so like some people might be frustrated that it's like, oh dang, I have to have this much. But you, some people might actually be like, could I have more? Could I could I have more hold co rather than cash at close? How often do you see that? That's a that's a great question. So we have two types of primary clients that gravitate towards the holding company model, and. Those are you know, clients that are closer to the tail end of their career with, where they want a defined exit from their equity. You know, If they're going to have the opportunity to sell 100% of their holding company equity at a recap within you know, two or three years, and that aligns with potentially their retirement or at least stepping away from the chair, they like that because it yeah. gives some finality to the exit of the equity. And then we also have a lot of uh, young doctors that are not risk averse, that, you know, they love the the upside potential of the holding company equity and partnering with maybe a young DSO that's got yeah. strong potential for growth. And they've got the runway to potentially hit multiple recaps. And they really believe on what that DSO is building. Those are the two types of clients that tend to love the holding company equity structure. But I, I think you make a really, really good point. It's not just in a holding company structure in any DSO sale. You need to think about what are you going to do with the lump sum? Like you've got to invest it somewhere. It's nerve wracking to think about, okay, do I put all that money in the market right now? Well, what if the market dips immediately? Or do I go buy real estate? Well, I don't really have a lot of experience in real estate. Or do I go buy another business? And I'm not a good operator of a random business. So it's like, it's a problem that is stressful. It's a high class problem, but it's a problem. You know, <laughs> first world problem. Yeah. Very first world problem. Absolutely. So, you know, having a plan for that. Yeah. You know, what are you going to do with that capital? How much cash versus holding company equity do you want? Yeah. If you love what the DSO is building and you believe in them, then you may want more holding company equity and less cash. And we have had clients, sometimes surprisingly so, yeah. you know, decide to take less cash at close and roll more because... They really fell in love and believe in what that DSO is building. The other thing that you really need to think about, and we touched on this, but I think it's important to really call attention to it, is if you're going to sell 100% of the business, you have got to think about what is your personal burn rate? Yeah. What is your income going to look like annually post-close? And can you survive on your chair side income or whatever other sources of income you have? And uh, I think that's kind of a shock for uh, a lot of doctors sure. and their lifestyle is not engineered in a way that they can give up all the EBITDA. Yeah. And as a result, some of them, you know, put themselves in a bit of a financial bind. Right. And you sure can't go buy a Lambo and a big house with that big paycheck you got at close because you've got to supplement your income over the course of the recap cycle before you get to that next spot of the apple, that next liquidity event. Right. And, and I would say that, um, that's probably one of the worst situations to be in is where your burn rate includes your clinical income and your EBITDA. And now you're selling your EBITDA and like planning on, you're going to be immediately cutting into the the money, the cash uh, on close, and you can't properly diversify and invest that money. So like, I, I need think, to map that out. You have to map that out. Yeah, it's got it's got to be planned. So, uh, okay, so let's get into joint venture now that we've talked about Holdco and yep. we've we've thought about this. Absolutely. So, a lot of our younger clients with significant runway tend to gra or they have the high lifestyle, you know, expectation and living expense needs where they can't just survive on their chair side income. A lot of them gravitate to the joint venture model. So, 
in a joint venture model, you're going to sell 60 to 70% of your business typically in cash at close. And then you're going to actually retain equity in your business at the practice level. So it's more of mm. like a, a true partnership in the sense that you've sold 60 to 70% of the business to the DSO. You're going to retain 30 to 40% of the business at the practice level. And you're going to get your prorated share of EBITDA on an ongoing basis post-close. So you're not giving up 100% of the benefit of the EBITDA. You've got a liquidity event. You've got some cash at close. That's substantial. Yeah. And then you've got ongoing, if you're working chair side, you've got ongoing chair side income. And you've got ongoing EBITDA distributions. So the benefit of that model is that you're not giving up 100% of the EBITDA at sale. Uh, the other benefit is that you have the opportunity typically to exit that joint venture equity in part, not in full, at a recapitalization event. Mm. Most DSOs that utilize a joint venture, what we call a JV structure, they'll allow you to liquidate 50% of your joint venture equity at recap at the parent company EBITDA multiple. So if you're selling for, let's say, seven times EBITDA today, and the DSO hits a recap at 14 times EBITDA, essentially overnight, you know, you doubled the value of the equity in your business by partnering with a larger organization that's going to sell for a lot higher EBITDA multiple. Right. So it'd be, it would be, so, you know, you sold that 70% at 7X, you still are holding 30% at the practice level and you're allowed to liquidate half of that, but it's getting liquidated at 14X. So you can liquidate that half and now you still have half at the practice level or, you know, either because you have to, you know, have a minimum amount uh, that's owned by a doctor at the practice level. Um, so that's, that's kind of how that works. Right. The remainder of the equity. So most joint venture DSOs allow you to sell down your equity to a certain point. Sure. Whether it's 10%, 15%, 20%. And that remaining equity component can either be retained by you long term, irregardless if you work chair side mm. or not, or it can be sold to another doctor. doctor at more of like a private buyer price. Right. But the, D, the JV model is designed so that there's always a partner doctor at the local level, which long-term, in my opinion, makes it a little bit more of a sustainable model because you've got a vested dentist partner at every location for the foreseeable future of the business. So in a lot of ways, it's a more complicated model, especially from like an accounting perspective, oh, yeah. if you're the DSO. I would not want to be the CFO of a DSO that's got a joint venture model because you've got to calculate those pro rata EBITDA distributions Sorry, monthly George. or quarterly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, it's... Uh, and, and and so that 10%, you are earning distributions on that 10 or 15% uh, that you're holding at that. So you're, it's kind of nice because you're getting whatever your clinical like associate pay is plus a little bonus. So it's it's not as like strapped of like, a, oh, well, I could just go work somewhere else. You know, why am I working here? You're like, okay, I'm getting more than just what my clinical income would be. And I got this big lump sum and I got to participate in a in the first cap event. And, you know, so there, there's all those benefits rolled together. Yeah, it's it's got a, a lot of benefits, a, a lot of merit, especially for a younger doctor. I mean, the fact that you've got the ongoing pro rata EBITDA and you're not giving up all the EBITDA closed, the fact that you do have a liquidity event on the front end, and the fact that you do get to participate in recapitalization events, those are all massive benefits of a joint venture structure and why a lot of younger doctors tend to gravitate towards that option. Now, the other huge benefit is that it doesn't matter where you enter the recap cycle. Mm. So whether you enter the recap cycle early or late, you get the same return. So it's really, really attractive for a lot of doctors to sell to a joint venture buyer right before they recap because mm. they get the immediate lift at the recapitalization event by monetizing that additional piece of equity at a much higher valuation. So most of the time when we go to market, we're creating a highly competitive environment. We're bringing all different types of deal structures to the table. So it's really cool when you start to lay the offers out and start to evaluate deal structure to deal structure and then evaluate where are they at in their recap cycle. You know, how sensitive to are you to return? How sensitive are you to liquidity? Hmm. If we're comparing a holding company model, late cycle, where the return's going to be muted, to a joint venture model, late cycle, where you're going to get the full return, a lot of our clients are going to gravitate towards the joint venture model because they're going to get the full lift irregardless of the fact that they're entering late cycle. That's interesting because from the DSO's perspective, 
the the uh, joint venture ones, they probably have like a lot of practices being added right before absolutely uh, that liquidation event before that recap. It gets very attractive right before recap. And the other ones, the the uh, whoa, 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 whoa. holding company, hold, the hold co model, you've got the opposite right after they have a recap that's like the most attractive time to join on. And so they, and they've got more capital to go buy new ones. So they buy a bunch of them right after that, that recap cycle. So weird. Yeah. So, I mean, it, when you start unpacking these things, you start to realize like how complicated these decisions should be. Right. If you do it right, we have a really, really sophisticated cash flow model that we often run pre-market. So we'll walk through with the doctor, you know, you have options and one option is to do nothing to continue to own your business and eventually sell it, maybe to a private buyer, maybe to a DSO. We're going to model that out over a five-year window. What does that look like economically? And then we're going to model out what would a joint venture model look like? What mm. would a holding company model look like? And we're going to use that as a tool for our clients to make a decision as to if and when it's time to go to market, if they want to pursue this path. And then we use it again after we go to market and we get all the offers, we plug each individual offer in to that model and show them how does each model play out? How does each offer play out on a five-year window? Not just cumulatively, but year to year comparing Comparison. old co joint venture. Uh, so then you can, you can really model what is the lifetime value of this deal that I'm pre being presented based on these assumptions, right. based on the you know, current offers, based on the current interest rate, you know, all the stuff that gets baked into this. Exactly. So the joint venture model has a lot of benefits. I think the the one you know big drawback is the fact that you don't have a definitive line of sight of exiting that retained last equity component, that 10 last fifteen percent of yeah, the practice, twenty percent, whatever. But for a lot of doctors, it's like, hey, I'll just hang on to that. Yeah. I'll just become more of like a passive investor in my practice, and as long as the business continues to perform well, the DSO doesn't care if you're there or not, really. Right. Interesting. Okay. Cool. So, what other models are there? So the the other prevalent model that's out there, holding company and joint venture are by far the models the vast that you majority. see. The vast majority of DSOs today. Okay. And that's what most of our clients are looking for. One, one or the other, and they typically want exposure to multiple DSOs, multiple bids from each type are, of, are, of those buyers. Are you allowed to, like, you know, I don't, I don't want to put you in a weird position, but are you allowed to, like, point out any, like, big names that we would recognize that fall into either of those categories? So the holding company model is the traditional private equity model. So okay. the vast majority of DSOs utilize the joint venture model. MB2 kind of pioneered the joint venture model. Okay. And so they're kind of the 800 pound gorilla when you talk about joint venture model. But now, because they've done well and hit multiple recaps, there are a lot of smaller DSOs that are emulating that joint venture model and are in a high growth cycle and therefore have the propensity to hit multiple recaps over the next, you know, few years, as opposed to as DSOs get big, typically their recap cycle is prolonged mm. and the returns are going to be muted to some degree versus looking at a smaller DSO that has more upside opportunity and is going to likely hit multiple recaps and generate a higher return because of those compounding impacts compared to some of the smaller players so, you know, what does that look like? You know, again, explaining like the arbitrage game. Well, you can imagine if I'm a 500 location DSO mm -hmm. and I add, you know, 250 locations over a recap cycle, I only grew by 50%, right? That makes me so tired. I think about adding 250 I locations. Know, right? That, that's a lot of work. <laughs> a lot of work. And you're only 50% growth versus if you... If you were 50. 30 or 50. And you added 250. Yeah. Over 500%. Right. So you're going to generate a much higher return, higher arbitrage over time than the larger DSO will. But, you know, hypothetically speaking, there's more risk, right? Because a larger company has less risk than a smaller company. Right. But those are the things. Comparing deal structure to deal structure, comparing the size and runway for growth from DSO to DSO, those are the complicated conversations that should occur if and when you go to market and you do this right. Right. So huh. we'll move on and talk about just the last two deal structures. The hybrid deal structure is a deal structure that we see occasionally. And the hybrid deal, stru deal structure essentially means it's a combination of the holding company structure and the joint venture structure. So in that scenario, you're selling, uh, let's say you're going to cash out 70% of the business, cash at close, and then the equity component is bifurcated into 15% holding company equity 
and then 15% joint venture equity. That joint venture equity in a hybrid structure typically can never be liquidated, mm. only to another doctor, right? right, right. right? It's not going to be sold at recap. Your proceeds at recap are going to come from the holding company equity. So it's really just a blend right. of the holding company model and the joint venture model. There's only a handful of DSOs out there that utilize that model. I'd say DCA is probably the largest. And, and then there also can be some of that like traditional holdback mixed in there too as well for any of these where you could sell and you sell 60% cash at close, 20% based on the performance of the practice over the next three years and me staying on, and then 20% which is in either hold co or joint venture or hybrid or whatever. So this is where it starts to like... Yeah, I mean, occasionally, you know, over the past three to five years, there hasn't been a ton of holdbacks. Okay. You know, normally it's like cash and equity. But I will say as the capital markets have become constrained and DSOs are trying to make their cash go further, yeah. you've started to see some of these earnouts and holdbacks start to creep into these deals. The other thing to pay attention to is, you know, there's sometimes clawback provisions if the practice moves backwards. They can actually claw back some of the purchase price. Oh, the original. Yep. Or dilution provisions where if the practice moves backwards, they don't claw back the cash at close, but they start to claw back some of the, the equity. equity. Your equity. So you need to make down. sure like what levers are in your deal if your practice for some reason moves backwards post-affiliation and try as hard as we can to negotiate out any of those earnouts, clawbacks, if possible, right? And you yeah. can only do that through creating optionality and creating competition from, you know, offer to offer DSO to DSO. The other thing I want to mention is we talk about all these nuances involved in these deal structures. We've seen some interesting things recently with yeah. the joint venture structure and people will call themselves joint venture, but not allow for any EBITDA distributions post-close. Mm. That's not really a joint venture, okay. right? Or they'll lever the practice with debt and the debt payments associated with the initial transaction, the cash at close that you took, they lever the practice with that debt and then erode the EBITDA distributions by layering that debt into your PL. I don't love that. Right. Right. Um, and then looking at management fees and operational expenses that are going to hit your PL. And then what are your rights at recap? And we have seen some DSOs saying, you know, we might trade for 15 X at recap, but your ceiling on your exit from your joint venture equity is at 10 X. Mm. And then we're going to get the bonus, you know, arbitrage. So making sure that you understand fully like, all these different deal structures, how they function. And then the nuances surrounding the equity uh, in particular, you know, the joint venture equity, that's where we see a lot of games being played in the marketplace today. You got to make sure that you do your diligence and, if you're flying blind, if you're doing it on your own, you don't know what you don't know. Like right. we play in the sandbox all day, every day. I see these tricks of the trade. I know what to look out for. My team knows what to look out for. And we're going to make sure that our clients are protected. And, you know, the predatory practices that private equity uses just don't come into play. Well, and it's funny because these are all the legitimate deal structures. And then, and then there's the ones that like kind of get weird. So, yeah. so the, we've covered the, the true options that were actually... Like how real DSOs operate. How, yeah. how these deals actually operate. And then there's like just some funny business that like you hear about and, you know, like I, I've heard of like single sites going for like 12x EBITDA. And then it turns out, I find out a year and a half later that they didn't actually sell. They just were kind of like grouped together and that was like what was projected promised. and that promised. Was promised. Yeah. And, and then it all falls apart. Right. So I'll get on my soapbox for a minute to talk Good. about, you know, the last what I would call illegitimate DSO deal structure, if you will. And that's the roll up concept. That's the concept that, you know, I'm going to take a bunch of unaffiliated, unintegrated practices, duct tape them together and take them to market and sell them all simultaneously to the same buyer for a much higher EBITDA multiple than they would sell for on their own. Mm. And we get this question a lot. Hey, Brandon. You know, I've got a practice with a million dollars in EBITDA. I've got six buddies. They each have practices with a million dollars in EBITDA. One's an endodontist, one's an orthodontist, one's in Chicago, I'm in Atlanta, one's in Florida. And we all want to go to market and sell to the same DSO at the same time for 10 times EBITDA. Because on our own, we're only worth, you know, seven times EBITDA. And that narrative doesn't fly. Mm. I mean, private equity is not stupid. And the dumb money, when we entered this new macroeconomic climate with higher interest rates and 
constrained capital markets, it's gone. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you could pull that off when, you know, three years ago, a lot of DSOs were approaching a lucrative recap or, you know, Heartland and MB2 were eyeing IPOs. Maybe you right. could have flipped that type of thing to them right before they right. recapped. They, or right they had like extra money they had to deploy and quick. And you happen to be right there when you had this bad idea. And they know they've got the buyer lined up and it's immediate arbitrage. Right. But a lot of these concepts were born in that environment. And that environment's dead. Mm. We're in a completely different macroeconomic environment than we were then. So... I'm okay sometimes when somebody asks me about them and their buddies going to market. What I'm not okay with is there are multiple people, some of them influencers and widely respected, that are currently putting a narrative in the marketplace that they're going to wrap their arms around the people in their circle of influence, and they're all going to go to market simultaneously and sell for an exponentially higher EBITDA multiple, and you're going to pay fees to join that co-op. You're going to pay administrative fees along the way. And then if and when some unicorn deal walks in the door, you're going to pay some huge transaction fee. It's never going to happen. Yeah. And a lot of people, you know, they want to believe that they're the exception to the rule and they're going to achieve this like insane outcome. And the reality is that they're going to get bled dry with fees along the way. And even if, a deal happens, it's not going to happen anywhere close to where it was promised. It might happen at nine times EBITDA, but once you strip out all the fees, you're left with a very average result and you were robbed of your optionality. Everybody's got a different why. Everybody's got a different practice. Everybody's got different goals. They're at a different stage in their career and a different season of life. They've, you've, you take 10 practices to market, they might sell to 10 different DSOs depending upon what the founders are trying to accomplish individually. Right. When you do these roll-ups, you're required to all sell at the same multiple with the same deal structure to the same DSO. It robs you of that optionality, the ability to choose the right deal structure, the right DSO for you. So I absolutely, I hate the narrative. I hate the concept. They rarely come to fruition. And when they do, they look nothing like what was promised. Brandon, you've, you've screwed us over at Shared Practices. If we wanted to pull this off and, and in a year say, hey, all of our coaching clients, we're going we're gonna to band-aid you together and then we're going to roll it up and sell Now you've already called our bluff. You just delete this episode, Richard. Uh, okay, 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 okay. There we go. No, I, 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 the thing that actually comes to mind is actually wholesaling. I don't know why I keep coming up uh, with real analogies estate. analogies are great. No, real estate them. analogies. Wholesaling in real estate is this concept of Go find these like off market deals with an out of state like uh, owner who's renting it, but now it's neglected. Make them an offer, put it under contract, but you 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 haven't you don't have the money, but right. you get paper. You get them to sign this, and there's like some clauses that let you back it out if it doesn't end up mm -hmm. working out. And now you go find an investor and you sell them this house who's going to rehab and flip it. And you're making this like difference in between, but like you don't have the money. And that's what's happening here is that people are trying to band-aid practices together and they don't have the money to actually buy and operate them as a group. And they're hoping that they can find this bigger buyer and make this big difference. But the problem is, is that they pull all these fees in, coaching fees, transaction fees, you know, DSO fees, that are not providing any value. They're 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 not right. taking on the central infrastructure to actually run a DSO. They Correct. don't actually don't have costs. Right. It it's kind of Ponzi scheme ish. It is. That's exactly what it feels like. Um, so I, you know I would I would not walk away from those types of you know co ops. I would run. Right. It's 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 not going to work out the way you want it to. And here's what I'll say. I interact with as many large practice owners are more so than anyone in the marketplace. If this was palatable, if this was real, I'd be doing it. <laughs> right? I you'd mean, be you'd be running the show. Right. I would have made billions of dollars by now and I probably wouldn't be sitting here if right. it was real. Right. But the reality is it's it's not. So I would be very very careful about buying into that narrative because I think you're going to be disappointed in one way or the other and I think you hit the nail on the head. The only reason they're doing it is cuz they don't have the money to actually do it themselves and or they're lazy. They don't want to do the work. They don't actually want to combine the cap table, integrate and oh, operate. It's, it's so a much ton work. of work. You know, you're yeah. doing it. You're in the process right now. It's a ton of work. They just 
want that silver bullet. They want that quick money. And the quick money, the dumb money, it doesn't exist in today's environment. I thank you for, for breaking this down for us because I feel like this was a revelatory moment for me of, of finally understanding a lot of the nuance of all of this. Um, and, I, and I hope our audience can get the same out of this of just like, okay, I understand the options. And, and now I understand also why I would want representation because, and, and I'd want to be able to bid. I mean, that's the other thing that this, the, the roll up robs you of is the ability to shop it to multiple DSOs and go with the one that lines up with your values, that lines up with your long-term goals and plans, and also is is the best for you in your situation. You you don't have control of the deal anymore because you've rolled it up into this thing that is no longer yours. Yeah, optionality is so key if, if you're looking to go down the, the DSO road. And I'll make one last point before we wrap. The vast majority of our clients are already talking to a DSO at the time that they engage us. <laughs> they already have an offer on the table. Yeah, They're already... All, sometimes deep in discussions with yeah. the DSO at the time they engage us. And oftentimes people associate a broker or a sell-side advisor, that's somebody that finds a buyer. We don't find a buyer. We find the buyer. And we leverage competition to create optionality and to drive economics. So if you're already talking to a DSO, we just say, hey, call timeout. Put that DSO on hold. Let's take a step back. Let's evaluate your practice from an EBITDA perspective. Let's quantify what's actually possible and then let's go to the open market and we'll re-entertain conversations with the DSO that's already at the table. And oftentimes when we hold their feet to the fire, all of a sudden their offer comes up dramatically and okay. the deal structure becomes more pliable. Okay, so so will you give us some specific examples on the next podcast? We can, we can generic, you know, like we'll, we'll pull out details and cities and all that. But uh, can you give us some specifics? Because I love these stories that you have. Absolutely, I could, I could tell... These, uh, these case studies, you know, over and over again, the story is similar yeah. from client to client. So look forward to doing that. Appreciate you having me. Awesome. Thank you, Brandon. And we'll talk to you next time on the Shared Practices Podcast.